infinite any kind of physical contact because of fear of, of, of uh, retaliation from the school district or the court system. So our, our, our sensory impact of, of security is an impact, right? Hence we have the, uh, the women's uh, home ownership being a sanctuary of, of four, right? So if we play that forward to um, Karen, you want to talk about how our health and our impact um, plays a role in this? Sure, well, let me at least say, um, so it's 345, and we have the last standing, so we thank you for being here during our panel, and as everyone else has shared, Desiree, just job well done. It's my first conference that I've attended with your organization, and you've just had a high quality event, and so you are to be commended over and over and over again. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and to the audience, I will say, uh, welcome to Chicago because I live here. And so you started out by making some comments early on around our great or reputation for being the murder capital of the world. But I would just like to ask you, did anybody feel unsafe while you were here? Did you really enjoy the culture, the rich history, and the architecture, the food? I mean, it's just a welcoming city. So thank you once again for choosing Chicago and bringing a little revenue to our city. So thank you for that. Got some stuff back there. So here's a question, and this is a setup. It's, it's, it's going someplace. How many of you, by chance, didn't Uber in or Lyft and took the train from the airport to the city? Did you raise your hand? It's 
it's not unique to Chicago. It happens in many urban areas, but now we have data, and I've heard others throughout the, the, the time here say they love the data. But the data reveals now that there is a variation and an impact to our well-being. And many of us that maybe in the real estate space, we, we really know it right from the work that we do. And you can see it regionally, you can see it by nationally, you can see it by neighborhood and by community. And so that attracted me to this place of health and well-being. And I shared with Desiree, maybe the poverty panel is the provocative place for me to sit because I'm really focused on wealth. And wealth is translated to health and to our finances. And what happens, we can't be wealthy financially if we didn't inherit it, if we can't work. And if we can't work, we don't work, but we can't work optimally if we're not well. And so our well-being really plays into food deserts. It plays into just overall systems in communities where we may not have a hospital close by. And believe it or not, there's so many communities and neighborhoods now that simply don't have a neurologist. And so if you know of anyone that's had a stroke, has had high blood pressure, the American Heart Association actually focuses on cardiovascular and heart disease, but also brain and stroke disease as well. And so I am just so attracted to the American Heart Association because they're steeped in data, just as CoreLogic is steeped in data. And so I love the science, love being able to connect the dots to what we all do. Because when we think about natural disasters and the environment, when we think about fires in California right now, when we think about floods that's taking place in um, the most recent one I heard was in the Savannah, Georgia area, when we think about hurricanes and tornadoes, think about those natural disasters. But what happens afterward? Affluent and non-affluent neighborhoods actually experience natural disasters but the recoveries are very different if some of them recover at all. We can still talk about Puerto Rico, correct? And so I share that to, to really talk about smoke-free housing, but all of these things, absent appropriate systems and resources, it impacts our ability regarding life expectancy. And when it pertains, or as it pertains to women, we're often right for ones from a well-being perspective that are really leading our households. We lead them, as we've heard all day today, in many, many ways. But from a well-being and health perspective, it is very much likely us that's in charge. And so when we think about natural disasters and the impacts of having medication available after a natural disaster, if you can't get to your pharmacy, you can't fill that prescription, you know, what happens? What's the impact? So I can go on and on, but I'll pause, Desiree, and have you just, you know, oh, yeah. Thank you. So Judy. Oh, I have never, ever seen Judy without cowboys. Ever. <laughs> I have never, ever seen Judy without another jacket. Lame excuse. <laughs> it was 110 in Texas, so lame excuse. But Judy is a woman who I met many, many years ago in LA when she launched a book selling the skirt, who really does an incredible job of motivating you without being a sales coach, of having pure confidence and pure dynamics. I'm thinking about different ways of having a classic human to We are like selling a product or service, right? So take it away, Judy. I'm not sure where to go with that, but. <laughs> so the truth is, I do wear boots most of the time, and I usually wear a leather jacket, but it really was too hot. Um, I'm much more than a motivational speaker, and the reason I say that is because I don't start out to motivate you or influence you. I tell a story. I explain what it is to be a salesperson, because every one of us is a salesperson. So you're sell selling and influencing. 
But I also talk about leadership because we're all leaders. You can be a leader of one as a solopreneur, or you can be a leader of thousands. But everybody's a leader and everyone's in sales. With that said, women have the worst critic in themselves. We create more lack of confidence than anybody else. And what, what happens is, if you think back to things that have happened to you, you have these tapes running in your head. And I want you to listen to one tape that I have to rewind all the time. So, many years ago, when I was a senior in high school, my father presented me with a beautiful certificate. Beautiful, with ribbons and everything. And it was letting me know that I had been entered into a beauty contest whatever, and I couldn't understand why my name was on it, and he said, you're entered. So I unentered myself, because I want to go to medical school, and he re-entered me, and I unentered myself. And then he sat me down, and he said, listen to me carefully. You have to enter, you have to win, because all you are is pretty, and you'll never amount to anything else. Did I just take the air out of the room? Yeah. I say that because I walk onto the stage, I walk in front of a room, all the time and I take the tape and I rewind it. That's the tape that plays in my head. The Surgeon General of the U.S. Army who was in charge of 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 people was followed with a, a camera crew watching everything she, did, she said and did. And at the very end they said to her, what are you most concerned about? What's your biggest challenge? And she said, confidence. So if somebody that does that Somebody that's on stage all the time, somebody that's on, anybody, has a story, has a tape, you have to rewind it. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be safe, if you want to do something amazing. And that's what self-confidence does. You have to rewind that tape and you have to say to yourself, I can do this. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get up every morning and go, wow, I'm just awesome. But if, that, if that's what it takes to do it, then you do it. But you also have to be able to use what's around you. And like Karen said, yeah, you are the, the, the sole uh, attendees right now, but you're the ones that, are, that want to hear the message that all of us are going to tell you because the people that show up, the people that are here, are the people that want to hear the message. So that's going to be our message to you. This is directly for you. There's something in each one of us that we're going to share with you that you're going to take back and say, that's what I needed. This is the price of admission. If you think about what she just said, high school is one of the most impacting of your life, right? But that's only if you were privileged enough to go to high school. What is it, you know, I'm gonna be, my 40 year, re my 40 year reunion was, um, I graduated one year early, so I keep getting mixed up between 77 and 88, uh, 77, 78, whether it's 40 or 39, blah, 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 because I graduated, um, so it should be this year was 40. So my, my concept is, is that I remember how I was treated when I was in high school. I was in water polo, I played all the boys' sports, you know, basketball, soccer, you name it, and, um, not soccer, sorry, uh, basketball and um, swimming and water polo, and everyone would, would say, oh, she's a prostitute, or a call girl. She has boyfriends in college. Now, my guy had never been kissed, ever. My parents were not affectionate. Wasn't that they didn't love me, they did everything for me. But they were not affectionate parents. They wasn't in their DNA until I met my current husband, who would give me hugs that would never let me go. And, Dude, come on, get this too much. And they convinced my mother to enjoy it. So my point is, is that if I remember those feelings in high school, imagine the child who got kicked out of preschool that I found out is very common. Imagine where their high school came from. They have no experiences to rewind that tape 
because the take is always the negativity in that the positive. So to have a child or a woman or a girl, to have that one reel be the positive rewind of the same reel and never be the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Imagine reverse thought process there, right? So the whole core was is not to make this conference go on a downside, but to make it that we need to bring and rip off this white, beautiful <coughs> wedding um, carpet that we had to leave down from the $400,000 wedding extravaganza upgrade that they did in six hours before our conference um, to expose the, the dark, black, uneven, you know, ripped up leather underneath here and then rubber and everything else that was gross so we can have a pretty picture. But that's what we're doing right now. We're not unearthing what needs to be exposed so we can all talk about it and address from the womb to the childhood, early create, pre um, create, all the way down the system because the complications of the problems are manifested from birth as we go through because we all have life experiences. So what I'd like to do is showcase how we're always tested. And I think if we know that we're not the only one and that we have a consortium of the people that can share a story, is at the end of the day what this is all about, right? We can help uplift and share our stories. And not to just go on and on and on and say, okay, we're so, but we're so different. That's why our DNA, I think every story is as many stories there are as there is DNA in the world, okay? And if we can help showcase where health impact drives is a factor of a lot because we don't have access to health uh, care, comes from poverty, brings it back to our confidence level, and how many few people make it out of, whether it be the projects or making an abusive relationship or something, they have to have someone who mentors them or brings them in from an outside of their, their sphere to get them to drop that hurdle, right? Um, so I'd like to address that. Um, how can we help drive conversations where I can have your organization drive to better communicate about the sexual exploitation and trafficking that Cheryl Earl, it's the woman who did, believe it or not, who did the um, opportunities um, panel yesterday morning that I don't think you guys were here for. She actually formed and is very heavily involved in Florida, in Miami, that has a whole training program for sexual tra exploitation and trafficking of girls into Miami, one of the hot spots in the country to hear this panel, you know what I'm saying? I should connect you too so you can have shared industries because she's second generation doing that. Has a huge school and, and productive program and all that kind of stuff. And then Gina, our last, she's centerfold, actually has a university in Mexico that actually gives them a different identity when they get victimized of sexual assault and everything else as an older person. So how can we help leverage the resources here in this room the banks, the, the, the Fannies and the Freddies, and the women realtors and the women that are doing uh, foreign nationalists and, and immigration to better collectively make this work. I know this is a very broad, crazy question of my thought, just running through my brain, is I want to figure out what nugget can we help that you think that would bring that table and start with you, Carrie. Oh boy, I'm on the spot. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that you know, we all tend to be so fragmented and siloed, you know, we, we stick with what we know and, um, you know, I, I think when we think about large social problems too, um, you know, in, in my world, we have a tendency to think, well, that's too big of a problem, so I'm going to narrow it and narrow it and narrow it until it feels solvable, but then we just end up working around the edges and not really attacking what the root causes are. So, I mean, I think something, at least for myself, I really try to work cross-sector and cross-system as much as I can, and I think that means stepping out of your comfort zone and, and talking to people who do work that is very different from what you do and trying to identify where the intersection is, where are those kind of root causes or, or um, issues that you both care about and you know think about what each system or each part of I guess you mentioned eco the ecosystem you know which each what each part of the ecosystem can bring 
Um, I, you know, I, we certainly don't have enough resources to solve any of uh, the social problems that are out there, but um, I think we have more resources than we probably think we do if we were able to package them together and make them work um, together better. Uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're we'll adding to the Brewer Report another volume, and maybe it would be a volume of um, resources that are nonprofits to help the cycle of, of sexual exploitation or some kind of value that we can do to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I would encourage people if there's an issue that you're passionate about to get involved in the nonprofit in your community. I mean, I, there's lots of folks who would love to have volunteers or board, or board uh, participation. There's lots of ways to get involved. I was just going to share again, sort of this unlikely thing. As a mentor, I participate in lots of leadership initiatives. And for anyone that may be familiar with the fairly recent and new civic or civil and human rights museum in Atlanta. It opened maybe four years ago. And when it opened as part of the opening, I helped to launch a leadership uh, initiative and program for students. They were juniors, sophomores and juniors in college. And we divided them up into groups where they worked on an assignment. One of those si assignments was sex trafficking. And that was a big initiative for the museum at that time. And so it was just a great opportunity for students to participate in that. And one of the students was a law enforcement major and really gravitated toward that particular initiative and is continuing to do work in that space today. And she's been out of college for two years, so. See, having that space, I think it's fantastic because we then can know and say, here's a place to go that's a brick and mortar. I think that's some of the problems that we work in such a virtual space that we don't have. I always say that I'm going to touch you because a computer can never make you touch. I don't care how great Chich is, I love her to death, um, and the IA spaces, but that human touch to me is so valuable because when I get hyper and I need someone to drill me down, if my husband touches me, I calm. It, it's got to be there. Uh, no, you can't do Sorry. So, so one of the things I think is if, if you saw all the different speakers and all the panels that were here, there are years and years of experience right here. And a lot of us didn't know who was going to be on the panel or, or know enough about them. And yes, you exposed a lot of people to different um, scenarios. But the point is I think this association can also help all the, you know, all the different challenges by putting out, you know, a directory of who they are and what their specialty is so we can reach out to them. And one of my favorite, favorite statistics is 65% of all women that have been mentored become mentors. And if you think about that, that is an incredible cycle to continue because being mentored is amazing. And if there's not a woman to mentor you, you find an amazing man. Because if you think about some of the big companies, the entire executive team are male. And you work until you can become a mentor. But I think between a directory of letting people know what your specialty is, and if you're open to somebody reaching out to you, because if you're not open, don't be on the directory. But I think that a lot of us need to know that if, if I have somebody that is you know, a, an expert in, in sex trafficking, why wouldn't I introduce them to you? You know, why wouldn't I do that? The fact that you brought the first lady in, she was amazing. Why wouldn't we connect people? Because that's what we're about, we're about relationships. And so if we can build relationships within this association, can you imagine what next year's gonna look like? It's gonna, it's gonna explode. So that's what I think, you, you have it right here. Well, thank you, I mean, in all honesty, the last 10 years of me traveling and hitting the pavement, I, I'm on the airplane every week, and multiple times, um, every one of the people who got up here, I know personally, their intimate story to the nth degree because of the fact, 10 years, I mean, no other, and not to pat myself on the back, but no other place have you had what we've done from poverty and sexual exploitation all the way to the C-suite or family offices, okay, forget the C-suite, family offices of the highest level and have the face, sorry Rebecca, of the financial crisis and all the way down the system to go through that. And that's because the leverage of, of trust that we have got to it. I'm gonna close the door back there, I can hear you. Um, but the trust of the development right through the cycle. And what we're trying to do is, is this is not for everyone, but if you wanna be part of the pocket, you, you wanna be part of the equation to change the demographics for women, 
at all mankind or womankind or human race. Um, and to get that women's independence of, of, of leverage to be equality, period. Um, we're not a feminist group, we're not a, uh, a directive to uh, be, I am woman, I am poor, and also that give me a job because I'm woman owned, but I just want to know the rules of the game so I can play the game, right? And I think more valuable is, is that if our children are living in poverty more, our women are living in poverty more, 37%, I don't know if you caught the statistics that I said yesterday, 37% more women millennials are living under the poverty line than any generation before them. How can we expect our women millennials to bear the children of the future, to not make crime more accessible, and take care of the mental issues that we have in this country if we can't take care as a society of the impact that we have sitting in this room. 10,000 people should have been here. The price was cheaper than cheap. You almost got to come for the cost of food. But the power is, who did we serve? We're not roller-based, we're not lender-based, we're not contractor-based, we're not insurance-based, we're not non-profit-based, we're not C-suite, we're not family offices, right? We connected the dots. But with the relationship of changing and moving the dynamic, I honestly believe that the seniors of level of women in all aspects globally will be able to benefit from what we're doing because we want to change how you as a human live and understand how the ecosystem plays into the heart of life, right? Um, and if we can do that, because I'll take the time for two seconds for myself, honestly, two minutes. I just went to court last Thursday, the day before I flew out here, to hear the sentencing of what happened to me personally, where I was a victim of $550,000 that was stolen from me, uh, 140 unsigned checks, 387 uh, forgeries, and the bank initiated credit, too, which means they actually gave money to have the money taken out of my account. I don't know, people know, but it is. Long story short, the woman's been in jail for a year. The bank, you know, was part of the whole equation. That's one of the lawsuit. But because I'm not a party to the lawsuit, she didn't have to go to jail for 20 months. 7,000 pages later, that was completely notarized, double stamped, triple checked, and certified, was brought to court. She served 11 months. I go in and testify. My husband goes and testifies. My son goes and testifies. Um, and not to bore you with all the details about my son and, and, and my husband and both of them was dying, blah, 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 blah. But you know what the judge did? He gave her two years. 50% of the state of California is already credited for any sentence. So it was reduced down to a year. She admitted to the guilt the same day she did it. Three years she did the stealing of the money while my husband is dying in one hospital, son died in another hospital. Effective means the millions had to sell a third to half of my savings. And my life will never ever be the same, nor will my children, nor my family, relationship wise or anything. And she got one year. I will never see the money again. And the judge's reason was, is because a new rule had just passed in California that they have no room for jails or for people to go to jail. And that, oh well, too bad, you don't have it documented. And I proved on paper, I proved monthly, I proved all the stuff and brought all the cases and how much money I'd lost and where I'd gone didn't matter because the DA didn't have all the paperwork other than I had phenomenal records to go show to him because the time limit was gonna run out. Too bad, she got 12 months. So the DA tells me, Desiree, I've got felons committing rape and murder that before I sit down in the chair that'll never serve jail time. And I was so woe as me, oh my gosh, this is horrible. But what was worse? is a case before me 
30 years family neighbors. Kids acknowledge you need extra help, and we all need extra help. Because my kids, as we're getting tired and going down, um, they'll hear me day after day. Why love? Oh my God, it's so fantastic. I'm so excited. You're in my office, and you don't hear me. Oh my God, did you share what happened? And they're like, oh my God. Because that's how I react. When I get done with a call and I'm pumped and you excited me and get me going, like the calls that I had on this panel, oh my God, this is great. And they're like, they're used to it now. But when they first started working, they were like, oh my God, Desiree had a heart attack. Let's go down. But I imagine everyone come in the office, not every day, but most of the time, because I want them to hear and feel my excitement or not. So they can understand the passion of why and what we do. Because you can't get that on the phone unless you see it and feel my body language and my voice when I'm talking. So that excitement to me was exhilarating. So thank you, Nikki, for that. Because you've gone through a lot of mental issues, I know, and I just go crazy and back and forth and all that kind of stuff. So I want to close with one takeaway from each one of you. Um, how, what is your goal in the next year that you would type, like to take your company or organization that you work for so we can take what we have here to make sure everyone in the room can excel and we can excel to make this so much better, not only for NRV, but for the entire ecosystem on behalf of all gender equality. She's like, 12 months, okay, that's right, really? And we won't talk, we'll start with Karen. Karen's got the corporate executive hat, so let's put, put Karen on the bus first. And I was thinking I'd go last. <laughs> <laughs> so my goal, and, and I fully intended to share it, because it's an ask, and so I'm so glad that you did this. Um, so I'm involved in so many different things, but at the end of the day, it really is a lot around us just trying to help one another. And one of the things that's on my bucket list, because I do have it, and I'm old enough to call it a bucket list, I guess it's transitioned now to a vision board. Um, but I would like to serve on corporate boards. And I was prohibited from being able to do so when I worked for First American and Logic because of conflict of interest. So as a result, since I'm not there and I'm managing in my own consultancy, I'm eligible to do so. So I'm the chair of uh, a board of directors for an alumni association for historical black college and university. You've heard me talk about the American Heart Association. I did not say that I was the chair of the board for the First American Foundation and the president and chairman of the board for the Core Logic Foundation. Um, but at any rate, so that's the next step in my journey for myself. So thank you for the question. You're quite welcome. Judy. So my goal is, um, we have a, a nonprofit foundation that is built around Walking on the Glass Floor. And Walking on the Glass Floor is a book and it's a training. And just picture the glass ceiling, it's the flip side. So we are going to be donating a good portion of the proceeds from the book back to foundations and charities and scholarships. So my goal, our goal, is to sell a million books in the next couple of years, but we want to be able to give back a minimum of a quarter of a million dollars back to different foundations, different associations, most things that have to do with women. And the training is for women in leadership, getting women to into the leadership position and keeping them there. Getting them there is easy, most of the time, retention is the hard part. So we're looking to get into uh, national companies, global companies. Excellent. The proceeds of that goes to under B because she's on our system. So. Just let you know if you want to buy the book, please buy it through us, and then we get a profit. They go, a portion of it goes to our not our foundation. So thank you, Judy. Um, Carrie. All right. Well, so I work in a, a policy team, and I work in early childhood policy. So I'll I'll talk about one of my policy goals for this year. Um, I one of my biggest focuses over the last I mean many years has been expanding access to childcare assistance funds for children and families experiencing homelessness. And we're very close in Illinois, so I'm um, really going to zero in on making sure that those policies get in place so our, especially mothers that face the most barriers to employment and housing, 
um, have access to such a key support, um, which is the, you know, that child care assistance. And I'm sure, as many of you know, child care is an extremely expensive um, and, and a major barrier for, for many. So I'd ask, you know, you, you all live in a state where there is a child care, subsidized child care, um, and ask you to raise your voice and um, ask that the that fund is well well funded and um, and is prioritized for, for children and families who need it most. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that um, while I uh, focus a lot on the bad news, and <laughs> I can bring, bring any group of people down with the facts that I know and the, and the stories of the, of the survivors that I have um, stood with um, for the past 30 years. What I can also say is that the overwhelming majority of men, um, both locally and nationally and across the world, manage to spend their entire lives never raping anyone, never sexually harassing anyone, never uh, creating the sex trade industry with their dollars. And what that means is that being born with a penis is not a, a sentence to be a, someone who engages in or creates sexual harm. Which means, which is why we can envision our community, locally and more broadly, as a community that doesn't have sexual harm in it. And that's what we do at Case. We try to do the work to make sexual harm something that, because it's not inevitable, stops happening. And while sexual harm does happen everywhere, and while it does land on people in every demographic, um, we also know that it disproportionately lands on people from six discrete and overlapping communities. First of all, girls and women, but also people living in poverty, people of color, um, the members of the GLBTQ community, people with disabilities, and people who are immigrants or lack legal documentation. And in Chicago, I'm very excited that my organization has just finished a strategic plan um, that is going to enable us to spend the next three years being a lot more explicit about the relationship between sexual harm and sexual exploitation and all of the structural and systemic and individual systems and practices of inequality that land on those six groups that I have identified. And I'm going to put it out here um, to all of you here that we have gotten support because of this new plan, a big new investment from a, a foundation. Um, and I'm going to be able to really, for the first time, hire a director level person um, to work on community engagement that is focused on that mission that I just articulated. So, um, I'll, I'll, my organization will be engaging probably in a nationwide search um, for someone I, I envision a woman of color, um, uh, but someone who has lived expertise and lived experience working on transforming um, systems and structures and processes of inequality in um, probably multiple of those arenas that I sketched out for you. So um, if you know anyone, if you think you might know someone who might know someone, um, please, please put my organization on your radar and on there and hold us. Um, Hold a good thought for us. Absolutely. So I want to thank the panel. Um, our goal, my goal for Editor B, is to grow. Um, we've already increased our staff by 35% the last couple months, is to increase it by um, another 100 to 200% by the next year. But more importantly, to connect. We are so well known in DC. But the community involvement of every one of us has to be greater and stronger, and we need to raise the notch that, oh, they're doing great work. It needs to be, no, we are doing great work collectively and not us as a group, because you are the group, um, and that needs to change. And I hope by the, the course of the last three days, 
um, that that has impacted you to the greatest level, to step it up, to really get involved, because sustainability in any nonprofit organization has to be on the backs of all of us connecting and leveraging each other. So in summation, our core is to make sure that the Wear Report grows in volumes, adding resources being added, but also leveraging every platform that we can and become the soul, become the source of expertise of all the communities that can reinforce um, that ecosystem of each tile because then we can leverage the resources and become the knowledge that we all need to share to help someone in need at any time, in any course, from birth to death.